Welcome to the Third Road Tesla podcast. My name is Safian Fraval, and today we have a very special guest. But before I introduce our special guest, I'm going to go through and introduce our crew. So our regular Third, third Road Tesla podcast crew. So today we have Omar Kazi, Tesla Truth. Boom. <laughs> and we have Kristen from Hi. K10. <laughs> Thank you. And we got Vincent Yu from Tesmanian. Hi. All right, great. And then we got Galileo Russell from Hyperchange. What up, Third Row? And then we got Viv, for, who's uh, Falcon Heavy. Hey. Great. All right, Omar, do you want to introduce our guest? Please welcome the inventor of the car fart, Elon Musk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Please put that on my gravestone. <laughs> Love it. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy that we're actually all here. And um, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, you're welcome. We're all Tesla customers, fans, and... So it's really good that it's finally happening. And I remember um, that I was looking at your Wikipedia tweet um, that it's like this bizarre fictionalized version of reality. Yeah. And uh, I replied to him, like, why don't you come on a podcast and like tell your fictionalized version of reality? Sure, exactly. <laughs> I tell my fictionalized version. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, you replied, okay, sure. And I was kind of like taken by surprise by that. And um, you know, the way you engage and listen to your customers online, yeah. it's like, I've never seen anything like that from, you know, CEO of a public company or sure. any executive. So can you tell us a little bit where that came from, why you communicate directly instead of like having this PR strategy that most companies have? Sure. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, it started out, I actually had one of the very, very first Twitter accounts, like when it was like less than 10,000 uh, people. And, I th and, and then everyone was tweeting at me, like, what kind of latte they had at Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, well, this seems like the silliest thing ever. <laughs> so I deleted my Twitter account, and then <clears throat> uh, someone else took it over and started tweeting in my name. Uh, uh, <laughs> <not> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and then a couple of uh, friends of mine, um, well, Lee and Jason Calcanis said, they both said, hey, you should really use Twitter to get your message out um, and also some somebody's tweeting in your name and they're saying crazy things so I was like, I'll say crazy things in my name <laughs> did you have to pay them no no they they they, they um, I, I'm not sure who it was but it was for some reason I, I don't know I got my account back great and um, and, and then I was just I, I don't know it, it's some degree it's like uh, just sort of I just started tweeting for fun really and my, my early tweets were quite crazy uh, as I was trying to explain, like it has the arc of insanity is is short uh, in that it's not very steep because it started off insane, <laughs> and so if it's still insane, it's you know it hasn't changed that much. Um, so um, yeah, and, and I don't know. It, it seemed it seemed kind of fun to. You know, as I think I've said this before, it's like, you know, some people use their hair to express myself, I use Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you like Twitter so much? I mean, you could use Instagram, as for example. As opposed to other but, platforms. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, like, I don't trust Facebook, obviously, you know, and... and <laughs> And then Instagram is is fine, but it's I, I think not exactly my style. Um, it's hard to convey a, a, a sort of intellectual arguments on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard on Twitter too, but it's uh, but you can't uh, you know it's so uh, Instagram is also owned by Facebook, and so I was like, eh. <laughs> you know, um, deleted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just deleted it. I, it's like I don't really need to just if I need to say something, I only really need to say it on one platform, pretty much. And um, so, and, and so if I'm trying, and, and I don't want to spend too much time on social media, so it's just like, okay, I'll, if, if if people want to know what I'm saying, then they can just sort of go to Twitter. You know, I'll just keep doing that as long as Twitter is good, I suppose, more good than bad. Um, yeah. Crypto scammers are really. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that they've been yeah. taking advantage of Vincent recently. Yeah, I know. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, there's like ten Vincents out there. <laughs> oh, all oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, they totally they yeah. copy everything and just like change one. Yeah, they thing. use my avatars and then the picture and then they just post like right below. Yeah. Your tweet, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow. Yeah. And they blocked me too. 
we fight them <laughs> all all, to, all the time we're always like reporting them like every day we report like every 10 day, people okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have so many like, yeah, exactly. Conversations on Twitter, like, come on, <laughs> can you just like? I think it would take like three or four customer service people to just mm-hmm. look look at this. It's crypto scam. Block it. It, it should be easy. It should be easy. It should be easy. Um, but then, like, my wife, Vegan Shelley, I think you'd like to tweet the other day. Um, she got banned for like replying to one of your tweets and quoting like the video inside of it. And then she got suspended for like a day or something. I was like, what the heck <laughs> is, is going strange. on? Yeah. yeah. So it's just weird how the algorithm works. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's a lot of manipulation. But, you know, going back to the Wikipedia page, you know, it's kind of interesting. Just sure. what a decade you've had. I remember I was reading somebody's article. I think they interviewed you in 2009 or something like that. And they said, you know, if you had met Elon Musk in 2009, right after the recession, they're like struggling with the roadster. You know, you never would have thought that. You are where you are today. You're, you know, launching astronauts into space. We will be, hopefully. Well, yeah, yeah, this year, you know, servicing the International Space Station. I mean, Tesla with the Model 3, the Model Y, you know, electrification really. Without Tesla, it would not be where it is today. You see where the other legacy automakers are. They're not doing great. So, you know, looking at kind of like this like you've, you've become this legendary figure and looking at kind of like how people kind of see you kind of the Ashley Vance biography or Wikipedia page. What is it that really kind of sticks out to you or, you know, makes you laugh? Like that's just completely <laughs> off base. Yeah. Um, well, I think I, I mentioned that the, that, uh, I kept getting referred to as an investor in, yeah. in like a bunch of things. And it's like, but I, I actually, uh, don't invest really except in companies that I help create. So I only have the only publicly traded share that I have at all is Tesla. I have no diversity uh, on, on publicly traded shares. Just like us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nothing. So, um, and um, you know, that's quite, quite unusual. So, uh, you know, almost everyone you have diversifies to some degree. Um, and then the only stock that I have of significance outside of Tesla is SpaceX, which is privately, which is a private, you know, private corporation. Um, and, um, and and then <clears throat> in order to uh, um, get liquidity, which is mostly to reinvest in SpaceX and Tesla, um, and occasionally in like uh, pro- provide funding for sm- much smaller projects like Neuralink and Boring Company, uh, then I'll I'll actually take out loans against. The Tesla and SpaceX stock. Um, so, the so what so what I actually have is is whatever the, my Tesla and SpaceX stock is, and then there's about a billion dollars of debt against that. Mm-hmm. So, um, which, which you know it's it's this is sort of taken to imply that I'm claiming that I have no money, which I'm not claiming. <laughs> 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 but I'm it, it's it's something to make it clear that you'll see some like number some big number in like Forbes or something people will think I have the te- the Tesla and SpaceX stock and I have the cash Mm-mm. and I'm being somehow just, I'm just sitting on the cash yeah. doing nothing <laughs> and I'm like hoarding resources I'm like <laughs> no it's, it's you know the only alternative would be to say okay let's give the stock to the government or something and then the government would be running things and the, the government just is not good at running things that's the main thing um I think there's like like a fundamental sort of question of like consumption versus capital allocation. Um, this is probably gonna get me into trouble, but uh, the 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 paradigm of say com- communism versus capitalism, I think, is fundamentally um, sort of orthogonal to the reality of uh, of, of 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 actual economics in in, in, in some ways. So. Uh, what you actually care about is like the responsiveness of the feedback loops to the maximizing the happiness of the population. Um, and if if more resources are controlled by entities that have poor response in their feedback loops, so if, if it's like a monopoly corporation or a small oligopoly, or in the limit, I would say like the a monopolistic corporation in the limit is the government. Mm-hmm. So. You know, it's just it's it's. This is not to say people who work at the government are bad. If those if those same people are taken and put in a, in a better sort of operating system situation, the outcome will be much better. 
Um, so it's really just what is the responsiveness of the organization to maximizing the happiness of the people. Um, and, um, and, and so you want to have a, a competitive situation where it's truly competitive, uh, where companies aren't gaming the system, um, and, uh, and then where the rules are set correctly, um, and, and then you need to be on the alert for regulatory capture, where the, the referees are in fact captured by the players, um, which is, you know, and, and the, the players should not control the referees. You know, essentially, it was like, which which can happen, um, you know, I think like that happened, for example, with uh, I think the zero emission vehicle mandate in in California, uh, where um, California was like really strict on EVs, and then they the, the car companies managed to sort of, frankly, in my view, tr trick the uh, regulators into into saying, okay, you don't need, you don't need to be so hardcore about the EVs and instead you say say fuel cells of the future mm -hmm. but fuel cells are of course many years away so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> forever <laughs> so, so then so this that they let up the, the 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 rules and then you know GM recalled the EV1 and crushed them in, in, in exactly. like yeah. a junkyard which was against the wishes of the owner yeah. I mean, they, they all uh, lined up to buy them and they wouldn't let them buy it uh, well, I mean Chris Payne did this great documentary on it and yeah. it's like the you know the, the owners of the of the EV1, which by the way wasn't actually that great of a car, but they still wanted the electric car so bad mm -hmm. that they held a candlelit vigil at the junkyard where their cars were crushed. Oh wow! It, like like it was like a like a prisoner being executed or something like that. <laughs> yeah. That was literally. I know. And, and like, so when painful. is the last time you even heard of that for a product? Right. You know, GM is stops the product. I mean, what? <laughs> I mean, listen, man, they don't do that for any other GM product. Yeah. <laughs> no. Have you thought about doing the EV2? <laughs> you know? yeah. it's, it's kind of sometimes hard to get through these guys, you know? So, anyway, I think that's a very important thing. Um, so generally, we could see like these oligopolies forming, uh, or uh, duopolies, the, the, um, and then you get effective price fixing, and then they, they cut back on the R and D budget. Like a, a kind of a silly one, frankly, is like like candy. Like there's a there's a candy oligopoly, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like when's the we don't see much innovation in candy. So you're still working on the candy company. Crypto candy, is that? Yeah. <laughs> boring candy. Boring candy. It was boring gonna, candy. It's going to be boring candy. I, don't, I haven't seen a candy yet that's good enough to <laughs> send out. But, um, and it's, yeah. Uh, but I, th I think it, it it's, it's th there's, there's like three companies or something that control all the candy in the world pretty much. It's crazy. Uh, and dog food. <laughs> yeah. There's somebody constructed like this, it, it's this, crazy conglomerate and and it's like and it's like dog food and baby food and candy and it's like all you know other brands a rendering yeah and you, hundreds of brands yeah you think you're buying from different companies but yeah. it all funnels up to like three companies wow. or something like that don't send the rendering food to the candy company <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah big candy <laughs> so you, you want to have like a good competitive forcing function so that uh, you have to make the product better uh, or or you'll lose. Like if you don't make the product better and, and, and improve the product for the end consumer, then, then that company should have relatively less prosperity compared to a company that makes better products. Um, now, now the car industry, you know, is, is actually pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's good. Um, and uh, and, but and so then the, the, but the good thing about a competitive comp industry is then if, if you make a, a product that's better, it's going to do better in the marketplace. Mm. Definitely. So yeah. uh, this, this is Gene Wilder's old house. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. It's amazing. Saw the photos over there. It's it's lovely. Thanks for having us here as yeah, well. Thanks. It's really special. Yeah, it's a good, it's a cool spot. Yeah. And it's got a solar glass roof. Yeah. Oh, oh, you, you see that? Portion yeah. two, right? We didn't notice it, but yes. then we checked it out the second time. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for my uh, three, so I, I'm waiting for version three. Well, whatever is they're going to put on, I don't care. Uh, version, give me version three. Yeah, looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah, we saw it at the store in Torrance. Actually, they've got yeah. it in the stores now. Yeah. Looks really good. Well, the the, 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 the it's in, actually designed such that you don't notice it. <clears throat> so, because like this, look at this old house. This is like a, it's an old house. I don't know, probably fifty years old, something like that. And, and it's quite quirky. So if you put something on that was like that didn't blend in, that it, it would it would not look right. It would be pretty strident and. Um, this had a black comp shingle roof, so I was like, okay, let's see if we can actually have it 
weave in and still feel natural, look good, and yeah, um, and I think it's it's sort of achieved that goal. Um, but yeah, this is a lovely, quirky little house. I'll show you around afterwards. It's got all sorts of weird things. Is it's it exactly what. Nice? Sorry. Is it Frank Lloyd? Right. No, I I don't think so. <laughs> I think it was just built in increments over time by probably several people. Um, but that. They they would have just knocked it down and built a giant house here. So it's like so glad they didn't. Yeah, it's super cool. It's really yeah, amazing. So. Gene Wilder is one of my favorite mm -hmm. uh, actors, actually. So it's great. Yeah. Awesome movies. So, so when when you come up with a product like the, the solar glass roof, I think a lot of people misunderstand that like your goal is to bring these crazy technologies to market and really create a change in the world. Yeah. And so I think it's fascinating that you do it through companies, and it seems like the fastest way to create that feedback loop and to really like get go from inventing something to millions of people using it right away. Yes. So like, like I, it seems like buying a Tesla is almost like the best thing you could do to help the climate crisis because you're like turbocharging R&D and products and innovation. I, I feel like not enough people really understand that. Um, yeah, that, <clears throat> that, that is, I think there's lots of good things people can do for the climate, but just generally anything that is um, moving towards sustainable energy, um, whether it's, it's sustainable energy, create, um, um, generation through solar <clears throat> or with an electric vehicle um, actually just th just things like better insulation in a house just is, is really um, effective for energy consumption um, but but if I find oh geez Marvin it's ingratiating that's Marvin the Martian oh I actually got him a little um, for Halloween a little Knitted Marvin the Martian cap. Oh, so <laughs> so he had the little, you know, the helmet with yeah. the. It looked super cute. You got enough, buddy. <laughs> so, did you always know, like, you know, business was the way you wanted to kind of attract attack these problems versus, say, you know, maybe a nonprofit or you know, working as a college professor or something? I don't know. Uh, well, when I was in in high school, I thought I'd most likely be doing physics at a particle accelerator. <laughs> So that's what I was, um, if physics and computer, I mean, I got distinctions in two areas in physics and computer science, and those were, those were yeah, so my two best subjects. And, uh, and then I thought, okay, well, that, I want, I want to figure out what's the nature of the universe. And um, so, I, you know, go try to work in, with people, banging particles together, see what happens. Um, and, um, and then it, it sort of things went along, and the, the superconducting super collider got cancelled in the U.S. And that actually was like, whoa, you know, what if I am working at a collider? It's been all these years, and then the government just cancels it. Wow. And then that would I was like, I'm not going to do that. So, um, so it's like, so my, my, my well, we roll, roll back a little. Um, like I was trying to figure out what, when I was a kid, I had like this existential crisis, and I was about twelve years old or something, and and I was like, well, what does the world mean? What's it all about? Are we living some meaningless existence? Mm -hmm. And and then um, I made I made the mistake of reading Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, and <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> don't do that. Not it's not it's not to be a little older, I think. No, no, and actually, lately, these days, I sort of reread it. Sort of like, you know, it's actually, he's not that bad. I mean, he's, yeah. he's got issues, he's got issues, <laughs> no question about it. But, but you know, it's, anyway. Um, so, uh, but then I read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams, uh, which, was, which is like quite a really, quite a good book on philosophy, I think. And uh, I was like, okay, we don't really know what the answer is, obviously. Uh, so, but the universe, the universe is the answer. And that really, what are the questions we should be asking to better understand the nature of the universe? And so then to the degree that we expand the scope and scale of consciousness, um, then we'll better be able to answer the, ask the questions um, and understand the why we're here or what, what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And so we should sort of take the set of actions that are most likely to result in us understanding what questions to ask about the nature of the universe. Um, so, the, so therefore, we, we, we must propagate uh, human civilization on Earth as far into the future as possible um, and become a multi-planet species to, again, extend the scope and scale of consciousness 
and incre increase the probable lifespan of, of um, 